welcome to episode 14 of A Cat and Her Yarn Respun. I have my studio back! Yay! And I have some new treats. I got these at the thrift store recently. One was $10, one was $15. I couldn't pass it up. They are actually originally intended to um, go outside when I have someday make my little spinning porch off of here. But for now, I thought they made a nice little backdrop. So, the introduction is not me spinning like it normally is because my wheel is broken. I can still spin on it. I just have to be very careful. And it tends to, um, it's the crankshaft assembly. The footman that connects to the wheel is called the crankshaft assembly on the Magic Craft Rose. And um, because one of the treadles had gotten loose, it puts stress on um, the crankshaft and it comes out now and once I realized if I tightened up the uh, treadle it doesn't come out as often but if I start and start and stop too much it comes out again so I'm hoping to have a new one by next month we'll see um, but until I'm a little bit more used to how I need to spin so that it doesn't come out I didn't want to have to start and stop um, while I'm showing you things so instead, the introduction should be, if I was able to access the pictures properly, uh, my recent trip to Mount St. Helens. Um, I, almost a year ago now, well, eight months ago now, we moved to the Longview, Washington area, and I knew we were near the access road point to Mount St. Helens, but I didn't realize how close until one day me and my mother, um, about six weeks ago, were just driving around and went across the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center. And while we didn't continue down that road that day, we did go back a couple weeks later and it, there's still snow uh, fairly close. Um, and it was a really pretty drive, so I took a lot of pictures. We'd stop at various viewpoints. Um, so hopefully the introduction was those pictures. Uh, so yes, painting my studio. The reason I haven't been able to record is because I started painting my studio several months ago, around the time of my last podcast. And I thought I would be able to paint a section, do a podcast, paint a section. Unfortunately, that didn't quite work out. These walls are real wood paneling that they slapped some paint on at one point in time and they didn't do any prep work before they did that um, plus they weren't installed properly so there's a lot of gaps that once you start getting ready to paint you notice a lot more of the imperfections in the walls and also there was a lot of gouges especially in this front window here this is a big front window uh, overlooking the parking area because this used to be the garage and they converted it into a family room and evidently what I finally figured out is that they had big dogs and those big dogs would jump up on this window whenever somebody would park the car and underneath that slab of paint on top of it having not been sanded properly to begin with uh, was just tons of gouges, tons and tons of gouges. And the window casing is all gouged up too, and I couldn't figure out why until I started sanding this, the panel underneath the window, and started coming up with dog hair. <laughs> so I have become very familiar with two different kinds of wood filler. Part of the reason why it's taken me so many months to do this is that one wood filler is very good for deep gouges and the other wood filler is very good for shallow gouges and I didn't know this and so I was basically using just the one putting them on the gouges and then the next day sanding it completely off being very frustrated <laughs> so I went to the um, hardware store and the guy in the paint department recommended a different kind of wood putty and that worked really well for the narrow gouges, but it doesn't work very well for the thick gouges. <laughs> and it has a learning curve. So it took me two months to paint this wall, most of which is a window. 
And the other two months was me, in, interspersed amongst all that, was me being frustrated and not touching anything for a week at a time. And because I had to have everything pushed away from the wall, all this area where I'm sitting now was all filled with stuff. So there was just no place for me to spin. There was no place for me to, to podcast. Um, I have been stealing some time by spinning in the, in the living room. I managed to, to move some of my mother's decorative plants and kind of wedge myself into a corner where I could get some nice light and get some spinning in. Plus I discovered a local yarn shop that had a weekly spin in. And that was very helpful for me to actually be able to not only get out of the house, but also get a, a good amount of spinning in. So, um, but like I said, um, we're done with this part. <laughs> I will be painting this wall next. You can see it's still the original yellow. I'll insert some pictures of what this wall behind the camera looks like now. Unfortunately, there's some stuff stacked in the corner because it was originally stacked in the back room. Um, but that area had been promised to my husband as his work area and he wanted to build a um, workbench. And so literally the day that I was going to record last, I ended up moving all the stuff out where I was storing there and shoving it up against this corner over here that blocks the door. Um, as soon as that paint was dry and I figured, oh, no big deal. I'll be able to podcast as soon, you know, it won't take me more than a week to do this section. And another four months went by before, um, we got to here. So let's move on to what I got for Christmas since I haven't talked to any of you since then. Um, the first gift I actually got in November because my husband was so excited about it that he made me open it the minute the mailman delivered it. Now he knew I had been researching sock knitting machines and I told him that they were out of our price range for a while because they can be around a thousand dollars. Well when it came close to Christmas all he remembered was that I wanted a sock knitting machine and so he found this. This is the Addy uh, Turbo Express, Addy, yeah, Addy Express, uh, knitting machine. This is the regular size. They also make a king size. And when he was researching this, it said it knit socks, which to a certain extent it does. However, it only fits, for the most part, worsted and bulky weight. So I'm not going to be able to use my fingering. But there are a lot of things I can do with it. I, I've been out doing a lot of research. In addition to doing uh, tubes, you can do flat panels, which is what I've got it started on right now. This is some waste yarn that I've got. So I'm going to uh, to start it. And then I'm going to seem to have dropped everything. Hold on. So I'm going to start the panel, the flat panel, and then I'm going to crank this up and see a, you know what kind of fabric it makes and stuff like that. I've got everything here set up on a... Uh, see that? This would be like for scrapbooking. This should be... There's these removable shelves right here and so you add, have all your paper. I've got another one that's similar to this that I use as my monitor stand. But I needed something, because everything comes out of the middle here, I needed something with a little more clearance than this height gave me on the table. I was having a really difficult time. So I bought this, and as you can see, I had my husband cut out a rectangle of it. And that gives me a bit more clearance when uh, cranking these out. So far, I have cranked out two tubes. I have three skeins of uh, Lamb's Pride Bulky in their Christmas green colorway. And I'm making um, leg warmers with this tube. I separated the tube into two. And now I'm knitting ribbing. I'm going to knit ribbon on either end to make myself leg warmers. And then this is what the length of what a full tube of uh, Lamb's Pride Bulky will get you. 
and I'm going to again cut this one in half and probably make bed socks. Well, no, I know I'm going to make bed socks. It's just a matter of am I going to make two bed socks at this length or am I going to cut it in half again and make four, make two pairs of kind of shorties. I'm leaning towards making shorties. And that way, um, either way, the first pair is going to go to my mother's. I'm getting the leg warmers for sure. If I decide to make some shorties, um, then I'll get a pair of bed socks too. So that's what I've been making on my new Addy Express so far. Um, I'm also the flat panel is probably going to end up being a hooded scarf, something like that. I've researched a lot of different options. You can make uh, sweaters out of the flat panels. Um, I think that I've been wanting to make a long strip afghan for a while now so I've got some ideas of how to incorporate that into an afghan with a few other um, maybe some knit squares offset things we'll see so while I can't use it for my fingering weight socks like I you know I still need my knitting my really expensive knitting machine to be able to do that there are a lot of things that I can do with this so that was the first present um, the second present he got me for Christmas was a jumbo flyer and bobbin from Acreworks for my Magicraft Rose. So that's going to come in real handy really quickly, very soon, because I'm finally at a point where I need to ply, and this way I won't have to cut the yarn as short. I, feel, I still think it's going to take two, at least two bobbins worth, but at least I've got a jumbo bobbin now. Yay. So another present that I got was for my sister, and you can't see it extremely well, but I got, pull it back a little bit, yay, I've got, I've got one of the uh, craft carts, and she used her silhouette machine, which is like a cry cut, to put um, a cat and her yarn respawn. Oh, sorry, a cat and her. It just says a cat on this level and her on the next one, yarn on the next. And I'll insert a picture so you can see the full. And then the back side, she put, let's see if you can see that, knit but first T. <laughs> so I thought that was really cute. And I have been using this a whole bunch. I keep this by um, my couch. And it just has um, my little laptop and my Kindle and all the other kind of stuff. So, yay! So those are the presents that I got for Christmas. But recently, um, around that time, I also went to an estate sale and I got a whole bunch of weaving books. And I'm just going to show you three of the books that I got. One of them is actually a dye book. But I got... Weaving, Warping the Loom Alone, which very nice, very, really nice pictures in it. And this is by Fulton Matheson, Teresa Fulton, David Matheson, originally printed in 1972. This is the third printing that was printed in 1975 by Serenity Weavers out of Eugene, Oregon. And I'm pretty sure they're not in business anymore. But this is a really nice, nice book. The other book, this is, which is like, oh, my precious. Oh, this makes so much sense to me now. Is Warping a Step-by-Step -step Guide. And this literally has some wonderful pictures. They're all these hand, kind of hand drawings like this. And I finally understand um, warping on a warping board. So what I've done in the past is uh, direct warping using my umbrella stand. I have a weighted umbrella stand and use the bottom of the umbrella, sit it about seven feet away from my loom, and then walk back and forth direct warping my loom. So with this book, it actually has a drawing in here where it explains how the whole process works of the warpy chain. 
and it just makes sense to me now. It just, it's, so we have you know, all these pictures, and it's just spelled out in a way that actually made it click. And this is another book that I'm pretty sure is, out of, is um, well, it's a self, one of the small publishing companies, so I'm pretty sure you can't find it anymore. But it's called Warping, a Step-by-Step -Step Guide by Marie Gale, printed in 2002 by Blackberry Studios out of Washougal, Washington. So another local-ish uh, publisher. Uh, this was the estate sale of somebody who had belonged to the local... Um, Pacific Northwest Guild, uh, which covers uh, Washington, Oregon, possibly a few other areas. My favorite book. As much as I love this book, this is now like my holy grail of weaving books. But my favorite book is this dying book. And it is, again, a little self-published book. And it's about lichens. Dying with lichens. And one of the best parts of this is that it actually has little bags of what the lichen looks like and a little strip of the yarn, the color that the authors were able to get. And there's several of this. There's several different colors you can get. Look at that purple, purple pinky purple. And the absolute best part of this book is the fact that it is another locally published book. And the two authors are from this area. And they go into detail about where they got this specific lichen within a few hours drive of me. <laughs> like, that's pretty cool. So it is called uh, Barbara and Me on Lichen and Learning by Ruth Robertson Merrill and Barbara McCabe Haight. The illustrations by Sarah Caverly Haight. Hoping it's Haight. It's H-A-I-G-H-T. By the Sherwood Press Olympia, Washington. And 1975. This is the second printing in 1976. So it's a lovely little tale, all, you know, the lichen dying aside, it's a lovely little tale of this woman's journey of hunting down lichens in the Pacific Northwest and just where she's gone and how she's uh, gone about finding things. Like she would stop at a lot of people's houses that had wood piles outside and knock on their door and ask them if it was okay if she could go through the wood pile and, and scavenge some of the stuff they normally knock off of the wood <laughs> before they put it in the fire front, before they bring it inside. <laughs> and things like that. And it's just um it's just a wonderful little book. I've I've read it a couple times now just for the story part of it, but I just love love these little I mean that is just so cool and I actually get to see what the lichen looks like. Look at the three different colors you can get with that one. Look at that. So I have to like take this with me and see if I can't find something similar. <laughs> um, I may or may not harvest anything anytime soon. I mean a lot of it depends on the state of the object the lichen is attached to. I had already been Semi interested, semi researching lichen dyeing before I found this book, and this just happened to be at the estate sale. So, one of the things I had learned while doing my research is that you don't want to just harvest all the lichen that you find. It's best to harvest it off of um, branches that have been knocked down by storms and things like that because it takes a long time for the lichen to replenish itself. So, like for some of the dye plants, that the wild plants, let's say there's a field of daisies. Um, I don't know what kind of daisy um, specifically. Let's just say there's just happens to be a, a field of one-eyed Susans. And in theory, if you harvest 90% of that field, there's a good chance that that 10% you've left behind will replenish the field 
so that there's just as many, if not more, the next year. Don't quote me on that. I'm just using that as an example, as an extreme example, uh, to point out that with lichen, if you were to go to a tree, a live tree with the lichens on, and scrape 90% of that off, it could take neighborhood of 10 years, 50 years, for the lichen to replenish to the point where it was when you harvested it. It's a long, long time. So you have to be really careful when you're harvesting it. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, right now, if you don't happen to watch the Green Bean podcast, but um, she is uh, currently, she's been talking the past couple of episodes, few episodes, she's talking about lichens because the next episode of her zine that she's preparing is going to be about lichens. So I thought that was cool that it's like all this stuff is coming together. There's also going to be a symposium that I can't go to because it's over a thousand dollars, but there's supposed to be a symposium in the fall about dying with mushrooms and lichen that's fairly close by. Um, and if I could afford it, I would totally go because all I have to do is pay for the ticket. I don't even technically have to pay for boarding. I could just stay at my sister's. And I think it's like an hour past my sister's. So hopefully lichen dying is going to be in my future. And this is going to be a really nice resource for, for finding uh, certain ones and having an idea of what colors I might get. So that, that was, I love this book so much. So one of the other things I got uh, around Christmas, I bought this myself. I went to a Christmas um, fair looking for a present for my sister, actually. But I saw this yarn bowl. One of the wood mer turning mer merchants had this yarn bowl. And of course, it's the perfect size that it fits inside this uh, project bag, which is why I got it. Because I was just like, that is like the perfect travel yarn bowl. It's made out of wood, so I don't have to worry about it breaking, and it's pretty, pretty thick wood. He, uh, he didn't make it too narrow, and the bottom is very thick. And inside of it, I have my sock project. I'm moving on to works in progress. So, I showed you this last time, and I had wanted to get to two inches before I started the stockinette, but it didn't fit right, and so I recast it on with a different cast-on method, and I got it to the two inches, but when I stretch it out, which I can't show you because it's on needles right now, but, so it doesn't really do it there, it doesn't, sh but when it's actually on waste yarn and I put it um, around my calf where I want it to sit, it's about half, it's about half that. And I don't think that's going to be enough to hold socks up. So the new plan is to knit this to four inches and start the stock in it. So the plan with this yarn is that I'm basically going to knit a tube. It's going to be in mostly afterthought everything type sock. And the pattern I've decided on using for it, well, three patterns actually, is the sock tube recipe by Peggy Flowers, which is actually intended for cranked out socks, um, but she has a really nice uh, instructions for making a cardboard template of your foot that made sense to me. I've, I've looked at a few other ones and it just, some of the placement pieces just, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it, but upon first reading this one made total sense. So that's I'm going to use to gauge where I'm going to put everything based on her pattern. Again, that's a sock tube recipe by Peggy Flowers. Uh, and then I'm going to cut the tube in half and I'm going to add toes from the bespoke vanilla sock pattern by Melissa Lund. And those are a little bit more anatomically correct. It's going to be a right and a left foot, which I've found fits my foot a little bit better. Um, the only other um, hand knit socks I've made in addition to trying 50 million heels, I also tried 50 million different toes <laughs> until I found one that, that seemed to fit. And the anatomically correct type ones worked really well for me. 
Um, that was a toe-up sock. This is going to be, in essence, as far as the toes are concerned, a cuff-down sock. So I had to find a new pattern for an anatomically correct. And the Bestoke Vanilla Sock by Melissa Lund looks like it's going to work like that for me. For the heel, I'm going to uh, use the Crystal Socklet heel uh, portion of the pattern by Lynn D.T. Hirschberger. I don't know if it's Hirschberger or Hirschberger. Hirschberger. I guess there could be a whole bunch of different pronunciations. I'm, I'm really sorry if I'm mispronouncing it wrong. I've done a pattern by her before. It's, um, I think it's the perfect hug shawl. I know it's something hug shawl that I did out of my hand spun and I love it. I love knitting it so much. I love the finished object, but I love knitting it so much. Um, she looked right here. So this is the perfect hug shawl by uh, Lynn D.T. Hirschberger, Hirschberger, and it's made to just sit on your shoulders without needing a pin, though I kind of stretch this out from having a pin at points, because sometimes I like to pin it on my, yeah, <laughs> I like to wear it like this, and that only really works if I pin it, so. This section's a little stretched out, but this is my hand spun. I love it. Love this, love this, love this. See the silver? I applied it with silver. <laughs> but I love knitting this. It's a drop stitch pattern, and it was so addictive. Um, I, I really want to make another one. I want to make a longer one. This is a nice one for just keeping your shoulders warm. Um, it's a decent length. But I really want a longer one. And I just liked knitting it. So someday I will knit it again. So back to my socks. <laughs> so I was worried about when I recast it on if it wouldn't flash anymore. But it is. It's spiraling nicely. Only the, the top edge is a little bit different because of the uh, cast on I did, which was instead of casting on... Let's say I cast on 64 stitches with original cast on. With this one, you cat that would be you take half of your cast on and add that, so that would be what, 22, so 86. So in theory, I cast on 86 stitches, and then the the first actual ribbing row, you um, decrease. You knit one, you decrease one. I think that's what I did. And then I started the ring. I'm not 100% sure. I wonder if I put notes about that. Well, at any rate, it worked. And I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to make a, uh, a mirror of this when I get to the other end of this tube. But other than that, <laughs> uh, it worked out nice and I'm really happy with it. I just need to actually knit. But I've been addict addicted to spinning, which I think is another reason why my spinning wheel broke. Because I was just on a tear with my spinning. And I, um, I'm done with my rainbow spin. Well, at least I'm done with the singles. So, some of you might know that, not this past Christmas, but Christmas before that, my husband got me the Nancy Knit uh Jumbo Ball Binder. So, so nice to use. When they say jumbo ball winder, they're not kidding. Look at this. <laughs> Look at how huge this thing is. Like, here, here, here. Hold on. So, this is a slightly smaller than average. It's about the same size you would get out of those little plastic ones. And Look at that. Look how much size difference here. It's insane! <laughs> I think it's so, so insane. And I've got this really cool, um, I can't take it out, but. So this was in an antique store. It has to do with, uh, it was with those other things, the, the perns that you would get from other industrial machines. Um, and it's basically shaped kind of like a cone would be underneath cone yarn. I don't know if that was originally what it was for. It's got a 
it's whole all the way through, but it's thinner on this end than it is on this end, so I can pick this ball up like this and it doesn't uh, fall off. Unlike this one here that, you know, if I held it by the top, it would all fall off. But yeah, this is, uh, this is the bobbin I just finished. So yeah, that's all of my rainbow yarn. It's not in order. These two, the balls are, but uh, can you see that? There we go. So there are uh, the bluey greens in the middle, then blues, then on the outskirts there's a dark green and a dark red because um, after I had uh, balled these up, <coughs> I realized that I really wanted a darker green and a darker red to incorporate. As you can see in there, it's kind of putting a shadow on it, so it kind of looks like there's a dark red in there. But anyway, even though these are not the correct colors, hopefully you're getting an idea that this is a much darker red than the red that's in the middle there. And plus just the amount of red her other colors, the percentage of red overall seemed kind of lacking. So uh, um, as I was getting done with this, I was getting close to being done with this one, I ordered a dark green, a dark red, and I also ordered some chartreuse just because I, um, somewhere in here, there's a chartreuse here, kind of a chartreuse -y color. I really liked spinning that. I'm not going to add the chartreuse to this one. I'm, I'm going to add it to another project, but I, I really like this color. Um, this limey, neon -y green. It's like a light neon green color. Um, and so I wanted to, to have it for another project, I guess. So I'm all done with my rainbow spin singles. And I'm going to start plying soon. And to give you an idea, this is my regular bobbin. And that's the Jumbo Bobbin Flyer. So, <laughs> this is going to be fun. So that's going to be for a um, Dream Bird by Nadita Swings. I'm going to spin up some, uh, it's basically a natural colored fiber that's been blended with rainbow uh, nylon sparkle. It says nylon sparkle on it, I'm not quite sure. I don't think it's Angelina. Maybe Firestar? I'm not sure what the official name of Nylon Sparkle is, but that's going to be the background color of the Dream Bird, and my rainbow is going to be the feathers. So I'm very happy about that. So uh, I'm going to wrap it up now. Um, there's only one more thing I want to talk about, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that and a little video of that to end this video with. So I inherited a ferret. I used to be a ferret owner. Uh, several years ago, but when I moved to Georgia, um, all but one of my ferrets had died right before that in the year in that the year leading up to me moving away. Um, and I didn't have a car that had air conditioning, and I was driving. And I know Georgia is very hot. I wasn't sure how to accommodate a ferret there, and I was moving for work basically. Um, and I'd only had that ferret for a few months. And I, so I rehomed him. Um, but I've been wanting another ferret. And now that I don't live in Georgia anymore, so back in the Pacific Northwest, um, where I understand how the seasons are and what I need to do to uh, to keep the, the uh, ferret cool, because they can die if they get too hot. We can stand heat uh, more than they can. Um, so uh, I was thinking about getting one, and a friend of mine needed to rehome his ferret. And his name is Ron Weasley. And so I'm going to end this podcast with um, some pictures of him and a video of him playing. So hopefully it won't take me too long to uh, before I record my next episode. Um, and I'll see you all eventually. Thank you for watching. Bye.